Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with David French of National Review and for the vacationing Jim Garrity. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And, David, we begin with a good martini, courtesy of the Washington Free Beacon here, and really the Washington Post, uh, related to a story that Jim and I talked about last week, and uh, I believe it was the crazy martini, where Bill Nelson, and Bill Nelson alone, uh, was revealing the fact that the Russians had supposedly hacked into the Florida election system, and they were in the system, uh, and they were ready to corrupt the results uh, in the fall. Curiously, it came out shortly after a poll that wasn't too good for Mr. Nelson, but here's the Washington Free Beacon story. The Washington Post gave Senator Bill Nelson of Florida four Pinocchios, its highest level for a falsehood, for his claim that Florida's election systems are currently under siege by foreign entities and that Russia has access to voter rolls in Florida. Nelson made his comments to reporters before a campaign event and in an interview with the Tampa Times on August 8th about Russians hacking into Florida election systems and purging voters from the rolls. When asked by the Times if Nelson meant Russia was meddling in Florida systems in 2016 or right now, he responded, right now. He further said Russian operatives already penetrated certain counties in the state and they now have free reign to move about. Later on, he said, quote, in June, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, a Republican, and the vice chair of the committee, a Democrat, Senator Burr and Senator Warner, came to Marco Rubio and me and said, we have a problem in Florida and that the Russians are in the records. We think the two of you should warn the election apparatus of Florida. Nelson has not been able to back up his claims with evidence, however. But to the Washington Post, fact checker Salvador Rizzo noted top officials have questioned the basis for the senator's claims. Quote, the Department of Homeland Security, the top election official in Florida, and election officials in several of the most populous counties in the state have said they have no evidence that Russia has access to Florida election systems. Nelson said his information came from Senators Burr and Warner. Neither senator has confirmed Nelson's specific claim that Russia has access to Florida's election system, though they have echoed his broader warning about the threat Russia poses to this year's elections. Nelson has also cited classified information. Although it's possible that this information exists and proves his claim, it's a tough proposition for the fact checker to accept since the Department of Homeland Security has denied Nelson's assertions. And the FBI (laughs) said as recently as August 2nd, there's no sign of efforts to specifically target election infrastructure. So the good martini number one is that apparently the Russians haven't compromised the Florida voter roll system. And number two, kudos to the Washington Post for calling out the guy. I'm sure they want to win uh, the Senate race with its worst score on truthfulness. Yeah, this is a, this is an example of when the press actually does its job. I think you're right. This is good on two two counts. I mean, the primary good thing is that the Russians aren't, in fact, meddling and right now inside the inner workings of the Florida election system, which would be uh, truly a truly a catastrophic s- a situation from the standpoint, not just of our electoral integrity, but international relations. So, you know, here was a senator throwing around some pretty reckless claims that, you know, would impair trust in, demo- in our democracy and also inflame tensions with our chief geopolitical foe. So think about how irresponsible that was. Uh, But yeah, that's the primary good martini. But hey, I'm right with you. Uh, You know, the Washington Post is often fairly criticized, uh, not just for its, uh, its, I would say sometimes not so subtle bias, but also its grandiosity. Uh, You know, every time you click on a Washington Post link, you're going to get that that you're going to get that new slogan of theirs, democracy dies in darkness. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but hey, when they come through, they come through. This is accurate. This is fair. And, and I'll say this. I'll say this in defense of the um, fact checkers there in, at the Washington Post. I have been pleasantly surprised uh, by their fairness more than once, uh, on even on a very, very important issues that are hot button issues in the culture war. For example, there's a very famous fact check uh, at least in gun rights circles, Washington Post fact check where Marco Rubio had said none of the gun control pr- measures that had been proposed would have stopped any of the mass shootings in recent years. And the fact checkers went through and said, true, that's true. And you know that that was not necessarily, um, you know, not necessarily what they wanted to type, but they did it anyway. So, you know, look, uh, in all the criticism of the press, there are some folks out there who are trying to get it right. 
um, regardless of their ideological leanings. And I think that's a pretty darn tasty martini. Yeah, great way to start the day. And uh, as we head into our, our break here, our sponsor might help anyone who's trying to stop Florida from being compromised by the Russians or any other state. Terrorist strikes again in London. Putin's nuclear ambitions are raising proliferation questions. There's a new military strategy in the South China Sea. Global events happening now mean the demand for national security professionals will spike over the next decade. America's security will depend on individuals highly trained in strategy, disruption management, and decision making. The Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security prepares students for a world full of instability. Students in our state-of-the-art school, just three blocks from the White House, take courses in counterterrorism, U.S. nuclear weapons, Russian politics, and statecraft. Our graduates are well-prepared for sought-after security positions in government and private sectors. Even more unique are the multi-full-ride scholarships provided by donors investing in future leaders. For more information, go to dmgs.org slash radio. For a career in organizations like Marriott and Boeing, the CIA, or F- FBI and a possible full ride scholarship, go immediately to dmgs.org slash radio. That's dmgs.org slash radio. All right, David, let's move on to our bad martini now. And we learned several weeks ago that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, had decided to shorten the August recess for members of the U.S. Senate. There's just too much stuff that had to get done, namely budgetary items as well as confirmations, judicial and otherwise. And after a couple of weeks off uh, here in August, they're they're back at work now. But not everybody is actually showing up, and that's leading to a problem, particularly when the people not showing up are the people involved in a very slim majority. Let's move to the Hill. The Senate is working through the August recess, sort of. Senators didn't arrive in Washington for this week's work until late in the day, Wednesday, and held their last votes of the week at 1.45 p.m. Thursday, adjourning a few hours later. Senator Dick Durbin, the second-ranking Democrat, skipped the week altogether, as did seven Republican senators, not counting John McCain, who is away from Washington indefinitely while he undergoes treatment for brain cancer. The poor attendance on the Republican side of the aisle did not sit well with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has emphasized for weeks that the Senate would work through August to get its business done. McConnell criticized his colleagues for skipping votes during a private meeting Thursday, warning it would be difficult to set up votes next week if so many Republican colleagues continue to miss work. With nine Senate GOP absences on Wednesday and eight on Thursday, Senate Democrats held a majority during the votes in the chamber this week. Two of the GOP senators who missed votes this week, Mike Lee of Utah and Tom Tillis of North Carolina, had signed a letter to McConnell in May urging him to cancel the recess. So... David, there's a good chance to get some stuff done here. They've got a one-seat majority with McCain out of commission, and uh, you can't even get people to show up. It's going to be pretty hard to get important things done. Two angles to this. One is, I would say, the less important angle, which is, uh, although still important, which is, guys, do your jobs. I mean, really. (laughs) You know, do your jobs. There's not a whole lot of us who can just sort of decide, particularly – uh, on important matters, just kind of skip it. Um, that's not something that you've been elected to do. You're not elected to skip uh, key votes. You're not elected to skip a key session. That just So just do your job, seriously. The second thing is, this is kind of a sign of a larger problem. And the larger problem is that Congress has has gone outside of the intention of the founders from being the supreme branch of government to being the least important branch of government. Uh, and it's easier to skip work when you're working for the least important branch. Uh, you know, when people say there are three co-equal branches of government, that's not exactly right. Um, there are three branches of government. They check each other. they are checks and balances. But uh, the founders intended Congress to be supreme. Uh, the, you know, Congress can get rid of the president. Congress can get rid of Supreme Court justices. Congress can govern uh, with veto-proof majorities. It can override presidential vetoes. Congress has an enormous amount of theoretical political power, but that's been largely ceded to the president and to the judiciary. And so I think it's kind of this sad sign of the congressional times that you can have multiple senators believe that they can skip votes in Washington, and it won't make that big a difference. And the saddest thing of all is they just might be right. Mm. They just might be right that it might not that make that big a difference because Congress has been so thoroughly sidelined. Doesn't mean they still shouldn't be, you know, grabbing the lunch pail, so to speak, and doing their 
their jobs like they're supposed to do. But it's a sad sign of the times that some of these guys apparently feel like they can skip without it really damaging anything. And that, to me, is the worst uh, aspect, the most bitter aftertaste of this martini. Yeah, there's just definitely a tendency to defer, particularly when both chambers and the White House are controlled by the same party. There's there's very little checks and balances going on either way. We saw that from 2005 to 2007, saw it in the first two years of the Obama administration, and we're seeing it a little bit now. Uh, the basic blocking and tackling of legislation is getting the uh, appropriations bills done, and our Republicans have controlled Congress now for almost four years, and I know the Senate Democrats like to gum up the works and prevent things from getting to 60 votes, but regular order was the rallying cry, David, after winning in 2014, and we haven't even come close to that. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, everyone comes in wanting to reform Congress and to re- revive Congress and rejuvenate Congress. But at this point, we have multi-generational inertia sidelining Congress. And I'm not quite sure what it's going to take to change this, because we are at the also at the same time moving towards a greater cult of personality surrounding the president. And that's a bipartisan trend. So I think it's unhealthy for our constitutional republic because it is uh, circumventing the will of the founders here and the design of the founders and not uh, and it's replacing the design of the founders with a more dysfunctional governing model. So I'm not sure what's going to right the ship here. It might take, uh, you know, a collapse of confidence in the presidency. It might take a uh, sudden changes in the political dynamic that are unforeseen or unexpected. But right now, you know, it's just (laughs) it's kind of a sign of the times that a bunch of guys say, eh, not coming to work. (laughs) And they and they realize that it won't make much difference. What do you think a Mitch McConnell tongue lashing sounds like? Because in my estimation, uh, Mitch McConnell enraged would be something like, you all need to come to work and you need to come to work right now. <laughs> How dare you speak of cocaine Mitch in <laughs> such boring, <laughs> low energy terms? I. How dare you, sir? How dare you? <laughs> cocaine. I, I. The last person in Washington that I would want to feel a barrage of wrath from is cocaine Mitch. I'd rather endure 19 Donald Trump tongue lashings and 50 Donald Trump tweetings than five seconds of a glare from cocaine men. (laughs) There you go. Yes. He can convey quite a message with a few words and and a couple of glances. That's true. (laughs) All right, David, let's move to our crazy martini now. And of course, all the chatter for the last several months politically, for the most part, has been about the, the midterm elections ever since we started getting special elections shortly after Trump took office because of the members of the House and and the Senate that uh, took uh, administration positions. So we had these special elections, Democrats doing better in some of these supposedly safe Republican seats than a lot of people expected. And so uh, that ginned up a lot of uh, expectation for a blue wave. Uh, That expectation still exists. A lot of forecasters out there now, at least predicting Democrats, are likely to take the House. Larry Sabato, 538, and some others are saying the odds are getting uh, better all the time. Uh, The Republicans say that's not the case. But some Republicans Republicans now, David, saying, you know what? Actually, if the Democrats take the House, this is going to be fantastic for Trump (laughs) in 2020. Uh, Politico has the story, and here's part of it. Quote, proponents for the go for broke scenario argue that Trump's at his best when his back is against the wall and that a move to impeach would both rally the base and make the president sympathetic to moderate voters. Some scoff at the notion that there's anything for Trump to fear from Democratic investigators on Capitol Hill, especially given the threat he's already facing from special counsel Robert Mueller and suggested that the House doesn't matter as long as Republicans retain the Senate. It dovetails with the growing conviction in Republican circles that the president could use congressional gridlock under a Democratic House majority as a personal battering ram, offering it up as the picture of Washington intransigence as he vies for re-election. David, I, I've heard of good spinning after midterm elections. <laughs> I've never heard it this far before one, though. Oh, this is sad. I mean, well, first, let's let's back up for a moment and, and understand that what this is is a, a tacit admission that there is no legislative agenda coming from the president right now. Because uh, I'm sorry, if you have a legislative agenda, you kind of need a House vote <laughs> to get that through. I mean, that's, you know, civics 101 here. So sort of a tacit admission that the Trump agenda is nominating judges, which I'm all I'm I'm here for that um, and being Donald Trump which uh, I'm not so down with that one. Um, So, look, you don't 
as a general rule, let, let's just put it this way. As a general rule, I, I think there can be exceptions to this, but as a general rule, you don't win by losing. Let, let's just put that out there. And second, I am not so sure that granting House committees, Democrat-led House committees subpoena power is the kind of thing that Donald Trump would be all fired up about. Because I think people don't really realize the extent to which the subpoena power and the ability to summon people for sworn testimony would put a whole host of sort of latent background investigations on steroids. Uh, you have all kinds of ways in which the Republican House, because it is not interested uh, as a general rule in investigating the Trump administration, is sort of leaving all of that to a media that doesn't have subpoena power, that can't put people under oath. Um, how many seconds after Nancy Pelosi is sworn in as Speaker of the House, if that's what's going to happen, how many seconds later would the House Democrats be subpoenaing Trump's tax returns? Could you even measure it in seconds? Would it be nanoseconds after she was sworn in? I mean, so and that's just one front in a, a just a huge battle over multiple investigations, likely impeachment. Um, this is something that. If, if your idea of what's better for Trump is more chaos, I wonder if you're thinking what's better for Trump or what's better for the country. I think it's bad for both, actually. Yeah, more airtime for and power for Adam Schiff. That's what we want as conservatives, right? <laughs> yes, let's give Adam Schiff subpoena power. Let's give Nancy Pelosi the gavel. Uh, because it's good for Trump? No, 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 no. That is, that is extraordinarily misguided. And the other thing that I think people are missing here is that if the Democrats win the House, and if, God forbid, they also win the Senate, the Democrats will move very quickly from saying, well, this was a referendum on Trump, to saying, well, this was a referendum on, on our increasingly radical progressivism, bordering on socialism. And so what's going to end up happening is the Democrats will start to view that they have, rather than sort of saying their mandate is to oppose Trump, which I think is going to be the more fair reading of of the results if they uh, if they win in 2018 will start to turn into a mandate for sort of the kind of quote unquote democratic socialism advanced by Alexandria Acosta Cortez, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, a whole host of other uh, Democrats who are likely to win in the House. And, you know, so that that is what really concerns me. And what you would begin to see is a Democratic Party flexing its muscles around this democratic socialism with their main opponent, Donald Trump, which frankly puts Republicans at a disadvantage in opposing a economic idea that would be extraordinarily destructive to the United States. So I say, why don't we uh, keep good Republicans in the House? Let's just keep them right there. Uh, vote for good Republicans. Block the democratic socialism of the increasingly radicalized Democratic Party. Make them go back to the drawing board and do better to win. That's what I think would be better for the country. David, you're just not appreciating the three-dimensional chess here at all, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. So much three-dimensional. But, you know, my small mind cannot comprehend and grasp such complexities like I win by losing. Uh, I, I, I'm not getting that one. Oh, David, it's been a fun week with you, but uh, let's end on a happy note. Uh, we're two weeks away from the start of college football season, and then the pros go uh, start a little bit later than that. I know you're a big SEC guy. I'm more of a Big Ten guy as long as it's not Ohio State at the top. So what are you expecting? So, what are you so looking forward to? So you're saying you like minor college uh, football conferences. I like traditional uh, powerhouses that have built strong legacies of uh, excellence, and I believe Michigan has the most uh, all-time uh, Division One wins. It's been 21 years since we've won a national championship, and yes, I know, I know your beloved SEC uh, has has done very, very well lately. But uh, you never know. I'm not saying Michigan's going to win it all this year. They might not even win their division. But more excited for college football than, than the pros this year. That's for sure. Our long national nightmare, also known as the time period between the end of the NBA playoffs and the start of the college football season every year when all we have is regular season baseball to keep us interested. So that long national nightmare is about to end. We're about to move into one of the best seasons of the year, which is the college football season. 
I am SEC centric, but I have to be fair and say that the SEC's dominance in the last few years is pretty closely linked to one Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, I saw a preseason poll that somebody put out that I thought was kind of funny that went something along the lines of this: uh, top four in the in, in the uh, in college football, number one Alabama, number two Georgia, number three Alabama's second team, number four <laughs> Alabama's recruiting class. <laughs> so. We are living in the era of Alabama dominance, but that, in a way, that kind of makes it fun. It's fun to have the big power to 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 shoot at, and they don't win every year, just five of the last nine. Uh, but but I, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to the NFL season. I mean, we've got Aaron Rodgers coming back. It was a great loss for anybody who's just a fan of football. It's a great loss when you lose for the season, a quarterback, one of the top quarterbacks in history in his prime. And you never know when we're going to be watching Tom Brady's last year. I mean, he's 87 years old right now, I think, <laughs> uh, still playing at, at uh, NFL football. So there, there are a lot of fun storylines for the NFL. So we're, we're rolling into a very good time of the year. Yeah, Tom Brady, Michigan grad. David, great to be with you all week. Always a pleasure. We'll do it again soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much. David French of National Review in for Jim Garrity. Jim will be back on Monday. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Join us then for the next Three Martini Lunch. Have a great weekend, everyone.